Good morning. My name is Kent Kim. United Nations Academic Impact Seoul Forum was just held for the very first time in Asia in August. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said UNAI, centered with academic communities, will become an important catalyst for the change of the world. Today we have four honorable leaders in this area to contemplate how to strengthen the global initiatives and cooperation on higher academics. Let me introduce President Kim Young-gil, Chairman of Korean Council for University Education. Good morning. Welcome. President Michael Adams, President of International Association of University Presidents. Good morning. Mr. Ramu Damodaran, Chief of UN Academic Impact Initiative. Morning. Welcome. Professor Sahi Milgram, Vice President of Hadassah College, Jerusalem, Israel. Morning. My first question is to Mr. Ramu Damodaran. The general public may be unfamiliar with UNAI. Uh, can you introduce UNAI in detail, please? Sure, Ken. Thanks. Um, if the UNAI is about 10 months old now. It was launched at the United Nations in November last year by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, whose personal initiative it largely is. He was really responsible in pushing it forward. He announced it first at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University, where President Adams invited him to speak. And since then, we followed out his instructions and came up with a plan. What it is, is a global alliance, a voluntary alliance, of universities and institutions of higher learning that are committed to working to help the United Nations address its mandate and challenges. When he opened the forum, the Secretary General made it very clear that governments no longer can solve problems alone, which means the United Nations cannot do it alone. It needs the support of new partners, particularly the academic community. Today, we have almost 700 members in 104 countries. We have more than 50 members from the Republic of Korea, and they range in their disciplines from the humanities to the sciences, public health, engineering, architecture, arts, music. So it's become very clear that there's absolutely no area of scholarship or human endeavor which cannot affect the United Nations or the lives of people around the world. And I think once we realize that, then anything that a university or an institution does makes a difference for people either immediately in their own surroundings or completely separate geographically. Wow. This is very impressive. This is taking a whole new step. Absolutely. And I think what's really remarkable is that it's brought together university leadership like uh, President Kim and President Adam, faculty like uh, Dr. Milgram, as well as students. Everyone is enthused and energetic. In fact, we have a whole students offshoot movement called Aspire action by students to promote innovation and reform through education. And I'm very heartened that the most dynamic chapter of Aspire is right here in Korea at Handong Global University. Wow. Um, President Kim, what is the significance of UNAI Seoul Forum in particular? Yes. Significance of UNAI is the reducing gap between developed, developing country through education, not giving just the money or capital. Mm -hmm. And education actually changing our mindset. Mindset, they change action. And action can change uh, our you know, uh, neighbors, then societies, then uh, whole world. So significance of UN AI is the changing the world hunger, poverty, all problem through education. This is very different from traditional method of helping developing countries. Uh, in the past, we usually gave a grant, loan, unconditional. Then uh, after having the, you know, having, they'll ask more. I think the uh, uh, Secretary Ban Ki-moon's idea is the changing the world and solve the all global problems through education. Mm -hmm. So the UN have a Millennium Development Goal and MD, it's called MDG, 
MDG is can be solved through education, through elementary and higher education. So UNAI actually using university potential of the uh, academic potential and vision and through uh, action. So that can change the world. This is the significance of the UNAI. Mm. So through education, it's about instilling uh, attitude and confidence. Yeah, right, right. President Adams, the need for international cooperation on higher education is acknowledged all over the world. What is the background for the globalization of universities? Kent, we're at a very unique time in human history. If you look at the origins of the university and her function, the first university was founded in Bologna around 800 years ago. And the function of the university was to transmit knowledge and to transmit civilization. And that was a time when change was very slow. In fact, you, you rarely noticed any change from one generation to the next. What's unique about this time is change has accelerated. Even in this last decade, the world has changed so radically because of technology, communications, transportation, that it's, it's, it's almost unrecognizable to some of us. A decade ago, uh, uh, social networking was the ability to, to talk glibly at a, at a party. It has a completely different definition today. Universities understand that our traditional role of transmitting knowledge and civilization has changed because the world has gotten smaller, it has gotten more complex and more interrelated. And therefore, a new role universities understand is that we really got to help us understand each other to help our students communicate in ways that are contemporary and reflect the reality of the world we're in. It's a new responsibility that we are coming to acknowledge. So the colleges and university must change as well. That's the point. And that's a challenge, too. <laughs> Great challenge. <laughs> Professor Milgram, why does the United Nations want to involve the academic community? I can hardly answer for the United Nations, but I can say as an institute that uh, we believe that every in institute must have international connections and collaboration with, our, with other universities and the academic institutes around the world. Unfortunately, not all the universities know how to make these connections and with whom. And uh, here comes the United Nations with a very important uh, role, first of all, as a facilitator. And uh, I think that uh, it can build connections and uh, collaborations that uh, could not be available without the help of the United Nations. And uh, as an educator, I would say that uh, the United Nations is playing here like the responsible adult. As a chemist, I would say that uh, the United Nations is an initiator and catalyzator of uh, this process. Mm. In terms, Mr. Damodaran, in terms of strengthening the international cooperation for higher education and promoting interactions, what is the ultimate goal of UNAI? You know, Kent, um, I think as, as Dr. Adams mentioned, we're in such a different phase now of international cooperation because of the rapidity of it. But, um, you know, look, for instance, at this wonderful backdrop behind you. Now, when whoever designed it, designed it for personal satisfaction, probably knew that someone someday would appreciate it, but there's no sense that this was going to be something global. Mm -hmm. Now, we have two almost contradictory impulses. You have scholars who work in loneliness because they need peace, undisturbed, to be able to work and create, accomplish and be remembered. And you have others who want to be energetic and to cooperate with others and reach out. The point of UNAI is that there's room for both the lonely scholar as well as the cooperator, so to, to coin a phrase. Because even individual scholarship intense and isolated though it may be, can make a difference. And, and I'll give you a very simple, simple challenge, if you will. 
Go through the list of Nobel Prize winners, no, not for peace, not for literature, for chemistry, physics, medicine. Look at the discoveries that they have been recognized for. You will find that each of them have made a difference to people's lives. That is what the United Nations is set up to do. So when those two, uh, two aims uh, uh, coincide, then you have an absolutely cooperative and mutually supportive approach. And that's really the mission of UNAI. To expound on that, Professor Milgram, what is the first step in creating international project for higher education? First of all, we must remember that uh, any project that is done is project not only between universities or institutes, but first of all, between people. Mm. And uh, that's why the first condition is uh, mutual uh, trust and respect. And uh, understanding that the both, or more than two, but both uh, institutions are coming in equal situation, in equal level, and it doesn't matter if it is north and south and, and developed and development. Believe me, when you are coming to, to, to make a connections with one institute, you must look straight in the eyes to the other people and then understand that this must be a win-win situation. And only from this point of view, you can begin, and this is the first step. Mm. I think you're saying that the horizontal communication must be established. Yes, and, uh, and uh, then the sky is the limit. Mm. President Kim, yes. the history mm. of universities in Korea is relatively short compared to, the, to that of the West. Mm -hmm. However, many universities have grown substantially uh, with the help from foreign nations. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the development of universities in Korea? Yes. History of uh, Korean higher education is relatively short. In the Europe, uh, maybe 400 years old. And in Japan, maybe 200 years old. Korea, uh, about 100 years old. And so the, the higher education actually started about 100 years ago. And uh, so the, uh, one of the earliest, uh, the first national university was Seoul National University. And other one is the, you know, um, uh, established by the missionary from the uh, Western countries. And uh, actually, the Korean higher education actually started after the Korean War, say, 1960s. Until 1960, higher education in Korea mainly focused on undergraduate, not for research. In the 1960s, Korea started for industrialization. And they need uh, some higher education, like the master's level, PhD. Until that time, many Korean universities, they didn't focus on you know, uh, graduate school. The first graduate schools established by government was the KAIST, through the age of the USAID. USAID, they helped establishment of the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. They are focused on producing masters and PhD. After that, private university focused on research was a post -tech. Pohang University of Science and Technology, 1986. And so after that, Seoul National Universities, many private universities, they also start you know, the upgrade of the graduate schools. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think the KAIST and POSTEC were first momentum for upgrading of the Korean higher education. Uh, POSTEC was strongly supported by POSCO because the graduate school of science and technology, they need a lot of financial assistance. So also the KIST was a, a government established research institution. That was in 1967. 
That was the, uh, helped by uh, USA, the Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, when he visited first time in Korea in 1963. And uh, he helped for financially establishment of KIST. So in Korea, KIST, KAIST, POSTEC, Seoul National University was a main, you know, the uh, higher education institution. Uh, that is uh, uh, helped by uh, UN, uh, in, uh, UNCRA, uh, UNESCO, and uh, uh, also USAID. And uh, now uh, we don't receive any more aid from the uh, foreign countries. But uh, for first in 1960, 70, and 80, it's very essential for having assistance from international community. Now we have to pay back. Wow. I never knew these background stories. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> President Adams, uh, many universities have flourished through cooperation with other international universities. I would like to hear some examples of those. A uh, very personal story, Kent, uh, uh, with my university, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, put yourself, it's 1962 in Bangkok, Thailand, no major universities, and an individual said we need to develop a comprehensive school. He receives a license to create a vo vocational school, not a university, hires a young individual as, a, as president, and asks my founder, Peter Sammartino, to sponsor him. So the young man comes and shadows my university president and my university makes a commitment. They say that the only way you build great schools is great faculty. And so my university sponsored graduate education for two faculty a year for 15 years. My university sent every summer faculty over for curriculum development, partnering with faculty, not directing, but partnering. He even talked the board of, uh, board of Governors of my university to go over one summer and talk about governance systems. So over time, we created this uh, DNA or alignment, intellectual alignment, academic alignment to help an institution grow. Flash forward 50 years, that DNA alignment, that uh, association is today Bangkok University with 27,000 students in one of the major regional universities. So I asked myself 50 years later, I wasn't there <laughs> to do that, but I asked myself now, where in the world should I partner? Should I, as a, as a university president, invest my emotional, uh, intellectual DNA to cause that to happen again? In fact, I think we all should be asking that question because it's, it's those kinds of relationships that truly bond each other and create a new. That's more than 40 years, that's 50 yeah, years. 50 years ago, yes. Professor Milgram, could you think of areas for academic cooperation between Korea and Israel? Actually, yes. I, I mentioned today in the forum that I really admire the attitude that uh, you Koreans have uh, taught uh, education. And uh, we can all see the results in uh, the achievements of your students in international uh, exams. And I think uh, your rank is uh, very high and uh, very impressive. And uh, I'm sure that we shall uh, have much to study from your uh, institute in uh, teacher education. And uh, I think that uh, collaboration could be done in that, uh, in that area. We in Israel, have a very good name in, uh, in innovation, in creating thinking and sciences, and I think uh, these areas uh, should be interesting for your uh, universities. And we also have uh, PhD programs that uh, are very attractive for students from abroad, including uh, uh, Korean students, and I am sure that uh, we can also uh, expand this uh, kind of uh, relations. Um. The level of IT infrastructure in higher education indicates the competitiveness of universities. Could you tell us more about these? Of course. Uh, there's a race underway. There's a race underway in the university community. Uh, the, the tools 
the, the tools have changed and are changing. The capacity of the tools to teach and learn are changing. They're changing radically. The tools are allowing us to connect with each other. We can connect instantly around the world. I, I, my university, we've wired every, every classroom so a faculty can walk in, plug into the wall, and, and be on the internet and be talking to a, a, a global faculty colleague in Seoul or, or in Jerusalem, live with the, with the students. And, and the access to information because of technology is so profound. The, the, the gateways are down. We have channels of information and access and speed. Libraries are changing. The tools are changing so radically. So what our challenge is, President Kim and I are, are in a race. Mm -hmm. We're in this race, and how do we respond? How do we integrate all of these new tools into the learning environment, into the doing environment, into the skill set our faculty use, the way our students demand and expect to learn and interact, is a huge challenge. And there's, there is this transformation going on. What is the, the new strategy is the red, the red Queen approach is no longer sufficient. The Red Queen approach is uh, just uh, run as fast as you can in place and you'll be okay. It's no longer okay. So technology is influencing everything we do. But technology has got to be used as a strategy, not as a toy. And that's the challenge for our faculty and for academic leadership around the world. It seems like the learning process is only the half. You've got to do something. Absolutely. You've caught on exactly right. It's not only using technology to learn, but once you've learned, using technology to do. That's how you change the world. To connect, to collaborate, collect, collect, to collaborate, create something. Create, to generate, to, yes, absolutely wow. right. Mr. Damodaran, the importance for international cooperation of higher education is well acknowledged. What are some cooperation measures pursued by subordinate bodies of UN other than UNAI? Well, actually, Kent, you have uh, examples right here in this room. Uh, President Kim and Handong Global University have pioneered a unique program called Global Entrepreneurship Training, where Korean students work with students in East Africa. And this started even before UNAI in partnership with the United Nations Development Program and UNESCO, the Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. But I think it really requires the genius of the institution to be able to tap these resources, come up with a workable idea and get that partnership going. President Adams has talked about new technologies, but I think he would concede that some old technologies are still very durable, and he is responsible for getting United Nations radio programs on university campuses around the world. Because we produce radio programs, but we don't have a radio station. And so we send them to broadcasting stations around the world, and you're in the medium, and you know that um, broadcasting stations aren't, are rather picky about what they get, and they're being supplanted by television and other means. But campuses still have a very live audience for radio programs. And so thanks to, to Michael Adams, we have that audience. One of the most recent achievements of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has been setting up what is known as the United Nations Gender Entity. It's called UN Women. So it's really brought together all the United Nations offices dealing with gender issues, specifically the advancement of women. It's barely, it started in March, so it's, it's um, barely, um, barely four or five months old. And within weeks of it starting, they had already established contacts with universities here in the Republic of Korea to work together on programs for women's advancement, because this is a country which has done singular work both nationally and internationally in that area. So I think you will find that um, UNAI is by no means the first or the, or the exclusive pattern of international cooperation from the UN. But I think where it is unique is bringing these strands together and allowing each institution to contribute according to its own genius, or for that matter, its own set of uh, geniuses or genii, if you will. President Kim, um, Handong University has been appointed as a global hub educational institution. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how UNAI will administrate the global hub educational institutions in the future? Yes, the 
global community is threatened by energy crisis and food shortages. Also the global warming, the weather changes, and uh, poverty. And uh, uh, as the founding president of the Handong Global University in 1995, I'm still serving as uh, Handong uh, the university president. And uh, my focus, our focus from the beginning was uh, global education, like this Michael Adams, the FDU. Was, uh, FDU is a uh, focus in the global education. Also, I focused, we focus in the global education. Uh, Handong Global Education is more focused on uh, helping developing countries because we owed from international community have to pay back. Okay, so the from 1995 and uh, Handong uh, Global University were invited and uh, students from developing country with full scholarship from the beginning. Okay, mm. uh, that was recognized by UNESCO. <laughs> At uh, 2007, uh, UNESCO they, uh, designated Handong as International Center for Capacity Building for Sustainable Development. Uh, we studied through the uh, entrepreneurship uh, education. We continued. Finally, UN recognized. <laughs> okay? And so uh, it, it started from the UNESCO uni twin, like university twinning and uh, uh, networking at the center. But uh, the now UNAI, they designated Handong as a, a, a capacity building higher education in this year, uh, 2011, January. There are three components uh, as a role of the uh, uh, capacity building higher education. First one is a, like education for global leadership through entrepreneurship education. Second one was green technology for green growth, sustainability. And third one is a, a, a prosperity for global partnership and connecting uh, between the north, south, south. North means advanced country, south means the developing country. So the three essential uh, role of the UNAI Global Hub for Capacity Building, there are three action, uh, three role. First, uh, entrepreneurship, creating from nothing to something by changing the mindset and this global leadership uh, uh, education. Then the green growth is very important. And so Handong is focusing for green growth for the developing uh, green energy for uh, uh, preventing the global warming. Also some food shortages by developing like super corn project. Mm -hmm. And also in the UNESCO Unitween for partnership, uh, we are the, Korea has a very unique position to help developing countries bridging between developed, developing countries. So we are acting as a catalyst. Mm. And we bring students, we send them to Africa and many developing countries. That's the main role of the UNAI, uh, the capacity buildings hub. Mm. I'm very thankful to uh, Ban ki also Rahmo Damodaran. Uh, he, we talked a lot. And so uh, uh, UNAI encouraging Handong. Also, we are doing our best. How can we help? Mm. Developing country. 60 years ago, Korea was a very, very poor country. Now we are in the position of helping them. Mm. It's quite impressive. I get the sense of how important it is for leaders to determine. The leader's determination is so important to make changes. Um, going back to President Kim, uh, will you please share with us one or two projects that, are, that you are administrating now? And also, what are your plans for the future? Oh, my immediate action is uh, we like to uh, um, uh, develop, actually create endless green, clean energy through uh, fusion, atom. There are, there are, atomic energy is a very ultimate energy, 
But usually the atomic energy is by fission. It's atom splitting. There is a lot of problem for, you know, disposal problem. But by combining atom, like hydrogen, is fused together. That became helium. And then fusion energy is a very clean, endless energy, like bring star energy over here. Mm -hmm. That's my first project going on. Also, for helping, uh, for, you know, the food is very important. Uh, we are in the uh, International Corn Foundation, and so we are uh, in, in, like the, in the process of the super corn. Corn is, is actually corn is a food. Also, corn is, is, is also bioenergy. There are two sources, mm -hmm. corn. One is bioenergy, also for food. That's my uh, main concern, like two projects going on. Wow, that sounds... Uh they're challenging projects. Um, President Adams, collaboration of universities and corporate sectors is regarded as very important in strengthening international competitiveness. What are some measures to enhance this collaboration? You know, I have had the opinion that in the United States that that collaboration had been responsible for so much of our development over the last 50 years. And that was confirmed today with a friend of uh, President Kim, who, uh, Dr. Shin, from NASA, yeah. uh, and presented us data that showed rankings of uh, institutional, academic, corporate interaction in the U.S. and the world is number one. So uh, an opinion was confirmed. And he also, Dr. Shim, suggested why and how that happened. And he suggested that it is largely uh, a government policy that both facilitates connections of what needs to be done, that establishes priorities, and then assists with identifying and providing funding. So, you know, frankly, you know, it, 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 the, the notion of uh, governmental agencies understanding uh, the power of this interaction is, I think, the primary way it happens. I, I particularly appreciate, though, also what, what, uh, what Dr. Milgram mentioned about uh, faculty, the power of faculty, because it's faculty working with colleagues. It's people to people. I've learned it, it's less than about organizational structures, organizational policy, and it's more about empowering the mindset of individual faculty to reach out to colleges, colleagues in the corporate community that causes things to happen. So it's policy and people that facilitate that taking place. And that policy also comes from people. You bet. It's a, it's a great circle. It's a great circle. Um, Professor Milgram, change and innovation are the common interests for all worldwide leaders. Universities also cannot be free from them. What is your opinion on this matter? I totally agree. Uh, I would tell you a story. I am a member of a forum which is called the uh, IUT, Improving University Teaching. Uh, it includes uh, professors from uh, some many universities, I would say, all over the world, that meet once a year and they uh, talk about methods to, to improve university teaching. And I see the frustration of some of them uh, because they know that when they come back to their institute, they can do what can, what they can do in their class, but uh, they cannot change anything else in the, in the institute. Mm. And uh, because, as Professor Adam said, it, it, uh, it's a uh, policy and people that make the product. And uh, without policy, people can do as much as they can. And uh, so those of them that were lucky, like, like us, to, to, that we have the, the, the authority and the power to, to, to make change, we can make change. But uh, some of them told, the, told us a story. He came back to, the, to his university and uh, with some suggestions, and uh, they got the answer. This university, of course, in Europe, exists 600 years. You want to change things in, in one or 10 years. And uh, this kind of university will not survive. Mm. They will sink. And uh, because 
changing is, is, is the name of the game here. And uh, if uh, universities and uh, institutes will not adapt themselves to the changing times, the changing academic situation, they will not survive. Mm. It seems to me that by education, you can better communicate, and by communication, you can create and change. I absolutely agree. Mr. Damodaran, what, based on your own experience, are some obstructions in creating international cooperation in higher education? The obstacles in cooperation and research, I think, are, first of all, financial. In a sense, universities are often under-resourced. Second, there are problems of uh, visa regimes. Scholars cannot travel freely from country to country. There are political obstacles. And I think thirdly also, we still have to acquire a sense of collaboration rather than competitiveness. So in other words, people rather than competing up to a point and then realizing that they can get much further working together, continue to compete and work in silos. And you know, it takes tenacity and a certain purpose, as, as Dr. Milgram said, when you try and find these connections, say, between Israel and the Republic of Korea, and are able to draw, join the dots together. Now, as far as education, higher education is concerned, I think there are two obstacles. One is, and uh, for, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on the subject from, from, from what I've gathered, there are far too many spurious institutions giving less than honest degrees. Mm. And people go after these, they get the letters after their name, and they feel they're educated, they go into the market, they claim they're educated, but they're always under false colors. And that, in a sense, diminishes the value of real institutions. So I don't know. I mean, I think my, my senior academic colleagues here would be far more equipped to answer this than I am. But obviously, there has to be some measure of standard setting so that employers know the worth of a truly educated employee or student rather than someone who is ordinary or mediocre but has paid the money to get a dubious degree. But that's essentially, I think, the, where the dangers lie. That has been the real problem in the, recently, in, even in Korea, too. Um, President Kim. Yes. It is said that the barriers among nations have been broken down. But on the other hand, the gap among nations are becoming larger. What are some measures to deal with this situation? Yes, actually, the, with globalization and uh, poverty uh, is, a, is a problem within nation as well as between nations. We have to reduce poverty problem within nations and between nations. And right now, many higher education, uh, they, are, you know, they make a league, top school, Ivy League or whatever, whatever they have a day league. Or under, uh, in, the, in, the, in the poor countries, developed countries, uh, they have, they don't have. There are no actually, you know, the mm, exchanging or, you know, the relationship. That is a big problem. So knowledge gap getting bigger and bigger. So what, what you can solve is, uh, is exchanges, collaboration, partnership between developed and developing countries. And uh, I'm not you know, talking about technology, because technology, what they need in the advanced country, and uh, they are so high, sophisticated, actually it's not useful in developing countries. Mm. There's some appropriate technology, like uh, which uh, can be used in the developing country. So appropriate technology is the, uh, in, we can uh, train you know, people, educate people, uh, uh, appropriate technology which can be used in their own countries. So uh, I think that you know, the, for solving this, uh, uh, the, the poverty uh, problem and the uh, uh, advanced countries, they should uh, educate <laughs> people, not their, their standard. And so uh, uh, what they need 
uh, in their own countries. And uh, if we have uh, educated people in undergraduate, uh, like the maybe master's degree maximum, then they could go to their own country, they could use their education, they learn in the advanced country. So I think to solve the, you know, you know, the poverty problem between nations, cooperation, helping developing countries through education is very important. Professor Milgram, all countries of the world are interested in strengthening core capabilities and fostering internal competitiveness. Sufficient funds and research climate are regarded as the root of core competitiveness in universities. What is your opinion on this matter? A competition is a part of academic life. And the competition is the, I would say, is the most ancient and the strongest motivating force. And uh, I don't think that uh, we want to ignore it. Uh, but we also know that, uh, as I mentioned before, it, uh, it, we must build on this, on this uh, competition, we must build cooperation that takes into account the competition and the differences, but understands the win-win situation and the, the, the main target that uh, is uh, more important than, than the, the, the competition. And we call it cooperation, cooperation with competition. Mm. There's two ideas in one. Um, I'd like to ask uh, each one of you, uh, you can make it short. Uh, what, um, I'm going to start with Mr. Damodaran. What are the goals that the universities in the 21st century should pursue? for strengthening international competitiveness and promoting interactions. You know, earlier today when I was speaking at the forum, I said the United Nations has the unfortunate habit of being very fond of acronyms. And um, I suggested we should have an acronym for SOUL, S-E-O-U-L, Seeking Educational Opportunities for United Leadership. And what I mean by that is that the academic community should realize that together with the United Nations, it can be a partner in leading change. Not working for change, but leading change. And in seeking the opportunities inherent in education to affect that change. So I think that really should be the defining movement, if you will, of our two great causes working together. Mm. How about President Adams? I think that uh, the imperative is for universities to create world citizens. Individuals who have the skill to look across the river and see people just like them. Individuals with the ability to, to look th at problems through the eyes of others. Individuals who can be proud of their national origin but also understand that the problems that face humanity do not stop at national borders for passport control. We're in this together. We've got to solve it together. Sounds like you are talking about fundamental friendship. Good idea. President Kim, yes. how about your opinion? In order to compete, many university education are focusing on accumulation of knowledge, okay? Higher and higher. But foundation is more important. Relationship is more important. In Chinese character, like the human being, like this. So foundation, integrity, and honesty. Without this integrity, honesty, foundation, if we accumulate just the knowledge for competition, going up, up, finally will fall down. So we have to educate, like whole person education, not only but, uh, the knowledge, have to, uh, you know, the honest, in, integrity base. Mm. So we have to, uh, you know, the, the you know, you, you found, you know, the whole person education is very important for competitiveness also. Mm. I get that the progress has two, po two components. One yeah. is competition and one is, uh, uh, what did I put? Live together. Cooperation. Yeah, cooperation, yeah. New partnership. That's it, yeah. Live together. 
like this. Very unstable. Okay. Competition and cooperation. Cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, uh, Professor Bilgram. I agree with uh, my friends, and uh, but uh, I would like to add one word: flexibility. I think that uh, universities, institutions, and countries must be flexible. Must must see the situation. Must understand what is going on and they uh, adapt themselves to, to the situation and not uh, stay in, uh, in Israel, we say, that uh, the, the fatal uh, mistake is to, pre to prepare yourself to, be to the previous war. Mm -hmm. And uh, some universities are doing it, and I think they must be flexible, they must, must be changed. That's the end of the questions. Um, this is very enlightening for me, and uh, it is a wonderful honor. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Kevin. You're quite welcome. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you very much. It. Yeah. Visions and tasks of universities are to accelerate the initiatives of global academic impact on higher education. I appreciate illuminating ideas of honorable leaders. Tomorrow, we will discuss South-South cooperation on higher education. This ends today's program, how to strengthen the global initiatives and cooperations in higher academics. That's it for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.